Um, so as you've heard, um, Access was launched in, uh, in March this year. Um, and our role really is to try and uh, bridge some of the, the gap between, uh, as the other speakers have said, between how the social investment market has, has evolved and the way in which it's relevant to every single uh, charity and social enterprise who might be able to benefit from accessing finance to, to help them grow. Our view is that uh, while there have been fantastic developments in many parts of the sector, it hasn't always translated into everyone feeling that they know where to go in order to be able to access finance, that there's support <coughs> there when they need it, and that the right kinds of uh, loans or blends of loans and grants or other investment products are there when you need them at the right time. So we hope to play some uh, role in helping to address uh, some of those challenges. So, launched in March, uh, supporting access to capital, particularly for charities and social enterprises, either at the kind of early stage of their development or even if the organisation has been around for a relatively long time, at a fairly early stage of moving to perhaps more of a trading model, more of a diverse uh, range of income streams and needing uh, a little bit of investment at the start of that journey to help develop those kinds of, uh, those kinds of operations. As we've heard, there are lots of definitions of, of social investment, and, and I agree with Kieran that they're all, they're all correct. I suppose the one that we're particularly focused on is making sure that there is access to capital for uh, perhaps smaller and medium-sized charities and social enterprises who, uh, who want to grow. And we know from uh, multiple uh, pieces of research, including most recently uh, the State of Social Enterprises, Nick mentioned, that this is uh, one of the major barriers to organisations growing. Uh, and uh, finance is needed for uh, development capital, for uh, cash flow, uh, issues that may come from um, certain contracts or uh, lumpy income that may come from fundraising and other sources. Uh, and so having access to capital is really critical for organisations to be more sustainable and to, to help grow uh, in, in changing markets. Now, uh, one of the key distinctions, and I'm sure I'm, I'm sort of teaching you how to suck eggs, but one of the key distinctions, of course, between uh, in, uh, and it's important to think about in terms of social investment is between investment as capital to help you change and grow and the revenue that you earn, that you receive, uh, the income that you get that helps you run the business and, and keep uh, the operations going. Now, social investment is not a substitute for declining grants or declining income. It isn't the money that keeps uh, the operation going. It's uh, it's investment that helps the organisation grow and change and helps to earn uh, more money and bring in other sources of income. So that distinction being critical, what we, uh, what we see uh, is that uh, investment is required by organisations earning their income in a variety of different ways. So not just public service contracting, <coughs> that is uh, obviously a big part of where the sector is earning its income, but organisations seeking to trade more with the public. Uh, and even uh, fundraise in a, in a more traditional uh, sense as well. So don't just think this is about um, financing public service contracts, it's partly about that, but it has application across uh, different income streams uh, as well. So you've heard some of this already, but um, just to kind of put, put our creation in context, I guess, we've seen a lot of developments in uh, social investment over the last few years. It's a market that is evolving and growing. We've seen new sources of capital wanting to achieve social impact in how they are deployed. So uh, government schemes, uh, a range of government initiatives going right back to, to future builders in the last decade. Uh, we've seen, of course, the creation of big society capital. We've seen the, uh, the tax, uh, tax break for social investment uh, in particular. Um, but also more broadly, a change of, of investor attitudes, people, uh, the, the, the young high net worths, uh, if you like, uh, young rich people in other words, um, perhaps more interested in, in deploying their money in, uh, in achieving social impact as well as uh, protecting their money. Um, new range of different products coming in, so uh, crowdfunding and other growth in, in opportunity for, for retail. Um, and uh, data around the size of the market varies, but it's somewhere in the region of around 200 million, uh, million pounds uh, of money uh, wanting to, each year wanting to be invested in this way. And the majority of that um, has been in, uh, in secured loans. So uh, loans uh, which are secured against an asset 
uh, the organisation uh, may have, maybe a building, or it may be uh, in some cases uh, in speech transport, for example, you may, uh, a lender may take security over a, over a bus or, or other equipment uh, like that. Now, that's where sort of how capital is being supplied, if you like. Um, in terms of demand, we're now seeing 71% of, uh, of charities seeing social investment as an appropriate way of, uh, of financing their activities. I think, obviously, less in the, in the social enterprise community, but in the charity community, we have seen a, a culture change over the last uh, few years around uh, social investment being seen as, as more acceptable and a more appropriate uh, piece of the financing mix for organisations. Um, we're seeing uh, opportunities in, in, uh, in a range of public service areas including uh, ageing, uh, sickness and disability and other, other areas where um, charities and social enterprises are playing, uh, playing uh, significant roles in delivering services. Now, if, if you think that the supply of finances is around uh, 200 million pounds a year in total, estimates of demand range uh, quite widely, but between 300 million and 1 billion uh, pounds a year. And, and that demand, as, as Nick alluded to earlier, is dominated by uh, demand for smaller size loans. Uh, median uh, in the state social enterprise survey is 60,000 uh, pounds. And that's unsecured loans. So uh, loans that are not secured against uh, property or equipment or, or any other assets of the organisation. And that's either because the organisation doesn't have any assets to secure uh, that loan against, or it's just not appropriate for where they are in their, in their stage of development. Um, so we're seeing a bit of a disconnect, I guess, between where the supply has been in, in larger uh, secured lending and where the demand is uh, in, uh, for many organisations in uh, smaller unsecured lending. Now in the middle of this diagram is, uh, is the acronym SIFI, and, uh, and while I am committed to try and reducing jargon, uh, I'm afraid SIFI is one uh, acronym that I, uh, I think it's pretty hard to do my job without. So social investment finance intermediaries, they're the guys next door. Uh, and they are typically uh, receiving investment uh, in large quantities from the likes of Exciting Capital and, and others, uh, and managing uh, funds uh, for charities and social enterprises and doing the lending and investing in charities and, and, and social enterprises. So um, they have a kind of key role in connecting that supply of capital to the demand uh, that's sitting here in, uh, in this room. So our sense is that that evolution hasn't, uh, hasn't worked for all, uh, all charities and social enterprises. As we've seen, there's, uh, there has been a lack of, uh, of provision of smaller, unsecured loans to organisations who uh, typically haven't borrowed before uh, and are seeking to develop their, their operations. Um, in order to kind of stimulate that demand that's there, that's up to, up to one billion pounds a year of demand, uh, we've seen capacity building programs like the Investment Contract Readiness Fund and Big Potential that you're going to hear more about later on today playing a really, uh, a really important role in helping to translate ambition into, into actually getting deals done. Uh, so we know those programs are themselves limited in their, in their time horizon and there needs to be longer term support for that kind of capacity building to ensure that uh, here into five year predictions and beyond can be, uh, can be achieved. And then for those intermediaries themselves, um, they themselves have, uh, have some needs to, uh, to grow and, uh, and, and develop, and particularly focus on developing uh, new products that can help, um, help charities and social enterprises to, to develop and grow as well. So there's kind of needs for support at all, in all aspects of, of that, and uh, we really act as have been created to try and address, uh, address that, uh, that mismatch. So why particularly has there been a lack of uh, lending at that, uh, at that smaller scale? Well, typically those CIFIs are themselves borrowing money in order to lend on. Now that means that they basically can't afford to lose, uh, lose that money that they're, that they're borrowing. So uh, the nature of their own uh, sources of capital means that it's quite hard to, uh, to do uh, this, this kind of smaller scale lending, which may appear to be riskier than doing, uh, doing bigger deals. It also involves a lot of work on behalf of those, uh, those intermediaries, so they need to be able to pay the staff to, to come and meet the social enterprises to make an assessment on uh, whether they are uh, the right people to, to take on a loan, uh, and also to provide support throughout that, uh, throughout that process. So basically the economics of it hasn't historically stacked up. 
And on the capacity building side, um, we've seen a number of, uh, sort of two, three year initiatives, but we haven't seen kind of a long term uh, vision for how um, the sector's capacity can be built. So those are really the two challenges that Access has been uh, created to tackle. So um, like Big Society Capital, we're a, we're a wholesaler. We're not investing directly in, in charities and social enterprises. And that's because we think that there are loads of organizations that are already really well placed to do that, organizations that are much better connected to the sector than, than we could be. Um, but they need to be financed in a slightly different way in order to unblock that flow of smaller size loans. So with a 22 and a half million pound grant from the Big Lottery Fund and a 22 and a half million pound loan from Big Society Capital, we are offering intermediaries a blend of, of loan and grant in order for them to uh, provide smaller size loans. And I, in a moment I'll explain a little bit more about how that works. On the other side, we're also, uh, on the capacity building side, we're also managing a 60 million pound endowment from the Cabinet Office, which we will spend over the next 10 years on programs that help charities and social enterprises better engage with social investment and access the market. And again, I'll tell you a little bit about where we've got to uh, with that. So firstly, the growth fund uh, is now open for expressions of interest from intermediaries. Uh, and you can see we've had a number of applications in already. Those intermediaries must apply for a, a blend of loan and grant, and it must be at least 50% uh, loan. Usually the ratio is, is higher than that. And the grant has three uses within that structure. So firstly, it allows that intermediary to take greater risk by essentially them not having to pay back all of the money that they're, they're receiving. So they can afford for some of the loans that they make not to be repaid uh, because uh, it's a blend of loan and grant that's financing those loans being made. Now that's really important in order to encourage those intermediaries to take greater risk and uh, allow them to, to back organisations that may not have such a track record but you know, have, have uh, a, good, a good plan that has a good chance of being delivered. Some of the grant can support the intermediary's own operating costs to allow them to provide that kind of support to get the deals done. And they can also apply for grant that can be used to pass on to the social enterprises and charities alongside the loan. That will be at the discretion of the intermediary and it would depend on your individual circumstances. Uh, so sometimes it may be 100% uh, loan, sometimes it may be 75% loan, 25% grant, depending on the kind of development that you need in order to, in order to, to grow. <coughs> The maximum ask for the growth fund is, is 10 million, of which uh, the maximum grant tranche is, is 3 million, and we're expecting to make around 15 uh, investments. Uh, and those underlying uh, borrowers need to be uh, either regulated social sector organisations, so by that we mean charities, kicks, those with an established asset lock, or um, particular, uh, particular um, uh, uh, asset uh, restrictions in their governing, uh, governing documents. Now, uh, in thinking about who can apply for the growth fund, we're not just thinking about existing SIPIs, so not just the guys uh, next door. We're also interested in partnering with organisations that have greater reach uh, into uh, local networks, and Kieran mentioned place-based social investment. We're currently talking to a number of community foundations who are very interested in developing social investment funds in their own area. We're also talking to a number of CBSs who are interested in partnering with uh, people who uh, can, can uh, manage the loan, uh, loan process for them to offer social investment very much uh, sensitive to the individual markets in which they are uh, they operate in. So if uh, that sounds like a, a, you know, something you'd like to explore further, then do please, uh, do please grab me a coffee break to talk about how, um, how we might be able to help you partner with someone in order to create a loan fund. It doesn't just mean you need to have done this kind of lending before. If you see an opportunity for creating a fund, then uh, we're very interested in, in exploring how that could work. Um, our process is, is fairly straightforward, a two-stage um, two process for our investment committee. The first step is very simple, an expression of interest that would take about 10 minutes, um, and then uh, we'd be delighted to start the conversation with you about how, how to take that forward. Now, the other half of, of our work is, this, uh, is, is, is to support uh, the building of the sector's capacity to better engage with social investment over the next 10 years. And we're currently in a conversation phase around how we should plan this programme over uh, the next few years and into the next, uh, into the next decade. 
Uh, we're looking for programs that support the sector to be better placed to be able to engage with, uh, with social investment and therefore more sustainable and resilient. Uh, and we'll be spending down that £60 million over the next uh, 10 years. The consultation is, is on our website and in terms of timing, we're right in the heart of that at the moment. We're shortly going to be publishing the emerging themes that we've heard so far and asking for more feedback on those uh, as we move forward <coughs> and cementing our plans for the next couple of years uh, in uh, the end of November um, this year. Those programmes will then start in April 2016. And in terms of some of the themes uh, that we're, we're hearing, um, there's definitely uh, feedback from the sector that support for social investment needs to be uh, clearer to understand and more, more joined up. Uh, in many cases, more rooted in, in place and the communities and the, the local context in which organisations are operating. Uh, we're definitely hearing that there's um, more need for support around measuring and understanding social impact, and particularly what investors and commissioners require uh, around how social impact is, is measured. Um, lots of feedback that uh, financial management skills in the sector are an area for, uh, for support. Uh, and also the way in which charities and social enterprises can combine together to compete at scale in order to raise investments and, and win contracts. Those are some of the things we're hearing. As I say, the consultation is very much still open and we look forward to hearing, uh, hearing from you. Quick note on, on Access itself, we're a very small team um, based in London and so our priority is to work through a range of different, different partners acting as a champion for the financing needs of, of charities and social enterprises. We also have a total impact approach to, to what we do and the most tangible way of, of explaining that is that while we manage that endowment of £60 million over the next 10 years, we're not just sort of investing that in the FTSE and, and making, the, making the grants off the, off the proceeds that come back. We're actually <coughs> seeking impact opportunities with the way we manage that money uh, during the life of the, uh, the endowment as well and, and very much want to share our experience in doing that with other foundations and other organisations who are seeking to invest for impact. We're committed to, to transparency in what we do and as soon as we've actually started funding the first programmes we'll make uh, lots of information available about uh, how those funds are running and also the underlying uh, organisations in which they're investing. In the meantime, uh, if, you're, if you're interested you can read about the development of our, our thinking on these different aspects of our work on our, on our blogs that the whole team are, are contributing to. So, um, I hope that's been useful in, in kind of explaining our role. Please do uh, consider responding to the consultation. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how, uh, how best we can help build the sector's capacity to take on investment over the next decade uh, and look forward to the consultation. Cool. Thank you.